<laughs> and that's why we chose him. <laughs> uh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I want to just first give honor to God for blessing this small town of Kansas boy with the um, ability to be here tonight. I also need to, of course, thank my beautiful wife Martha, who is sitting with me here this evening, uh, for being my rock and my support, uh, undying support with our endeavors for 1844. And of course, I need to thank the New York City Bar Association, and, and particularly the, the Diversity Committee, uh, and those members that you've heard already, Gabrielle Brown, I'm uh, getting tremendous shout outs, so let me just double down on that. Gabrielle Brown, Bay St. Victor, Jen Munoz, wherever you are here, and of course, Monica Parks, uh, who have been advocating for us since day one. As, as great as it is for Joseph and I to be receiving this recognition, this is actually, you know, recognition of 1844. And Ari's mentioned a little bit about that, and so if you don't know, I'll just briefly mention uh, a little bit about it. Uh, 1844, as he mentioned, is a group of over 60 black male law firm, so mostly law firm associates. Some of us have transitioned in house, like myself. Some of us have transitioned to government positions, uh, but mostly primarily practicing in the Vault 100 law firms here in New York City. Uh, we chose the name 1844 because that was the year that the first African American, Megan Bowling Allen, was licensed to practice law in America. So we took our inspiration from that. Uh, we got our start actually not too far from here over at Cooley, uh, where past champions Joseph Drayton, Dwayne Hughes, uh, Daryl Gibbs, among others, Wharton Bellamy, Nate St. Victor, Emerson Moore, uh, put out a challenge to over 100 black male law firm associates back in January of 2014 to invest in each other and to build relationships with each other. I, at that time, I had just lateral over to New York from a Jersey firm and had no network here in New York. And so I took that challenge and then went out and sent out an email uh, on January 20th, 2014 to a dozen folks I had to look up that email. Uh, and saw, and, I, and my email basically just said, look guys, can we get together, support each other personally and professionally, and give each other peace of mind so we know we're not out here alone on this island. Immediately, the response was tremendous. Uh, before we knew it, our dozen grew from a dozen to about 20, then over to 40, then to 60. Before we knew it, we had this huge critical mass. And uh, we were giving back, we had so much of the critical mass, we were able to give back to the community through panel discussions, to summer associates, doing uh, Know Your Rights training to minority youth in Harlem, to uh, doing uh, bar exam preparation for minority graduating 3Ls, uh, and even forming our own venture capital fund to uh, grow our wealth um, and, and build that way. And so we, we've completely taken, uh, oh, and by the way, I see the time, folks. And just so you know, time people, Gabrielle Brown was good enough to give us a uh, extra time so that we can introduce the members of 1844 here tonight. So before I get to my parent remarks on that, I just want to say uh, I was going to have you guys just stand, but she wanted me to actually name the brothers who were here. So uh, bear with me for a moment because I think not everyone is in the room, obviously. So I'll just start. Uh, when I call your name, please stand and remain standing so that we can know uh, who you are here. Uh, Dino Lovell. Preston Demache, Roosevelt Renat, Patrick Dorley, Manny Bashkin, Chasmine Gates, Jason Georges, James Hallman, Thurston Hamlet, Naheem Harris, Julian Hill, Julian Hill, uh, David Mitchell, Back to you. Eric Boucher, DC Moxie, Jamal Myers, Orton Endow, Ephraim Pierre, Alex Robinson, Obadiah Samuel, Nexus C, Reggie Snipes, Jason Spears, and Brian Warner. Uh, so please uh, join me in. The French filmmaker Robert Bresson once said, and my fellows will know this, uh, make visible that which without you might otherwise never be seen. So to that end, I wanted to share with you briefly my observations of the diversity and inclusion efforts, uh, in particular in our law firm here in New York City. And so law firm partners in the room, uh, I'm directing these comments to you, currently. 
uh, because as someone who has a unique position at the table of uh, such an uh, amazing group of fellow law firm associates, uh, we talk about these issues all the time, very openly and very honestly. And so I want to provide a window into and allow you to get a fly on the wall, if you will, for some of the repeated themes that we see over and over again. Either we are all suffering from the same delusion, <laughs> <laughs> or law firms in New York City have a little bit of work to do on diverse inclusion efforts. And because we're restricted with time, I will only mention two areas of improvement. This could be easily an entire meeting. <laughs> Those two being recruitment and retention, and the true elephant in the room, implicit bias. With respect to recruitment and retention, it's become painfully obvious to us that when it comes to law firms, law firms love to recruit junior associates of color. But when it comes to actually retaining us and promoting us up to the ranks to partnership, not so much. Uh, one of the partners at my old firm once told me, uh, once, once made a comment to me, he said, Conway, I don't understand. Why do so many senior associates of color choose to leave the law firms? Choose to leave. Choose. Like there's some kind of choice going on. <laughs> if recruiting law associates of color is like buying, say, a goldfish, and retaining those associates of color is like feeding the goldfish, <laughs> What law firms are often guilty of is buying a whole big, shiny bowl of goldfish and displaying this bowl on their website prominently on every page, taking the bowl to recruiting events at law schools. To look at all the goldfish we have. Come to our firm. And then, invariably, when the goldfish die from starvation, <laughs> the law firm partners turn themselves and say, hmm, peculiar. I wonder why all these goldfish chose to die. <laughs> Evaluations are made, and if you haven't seen the uh, next gen's yellow paper, uh, N E X T I O N S, uh, I highly recommend you to uh, Google that when you leave here this evening. It, it provides some empirical data on how implicit bias factors into evaluations at New York City's law firms. Uh, and also, narrative uh, how bad narratives of associates of color can be uh, manifested and put out to the world. It only takes one partner to put out a bad word about associates of color and that associate will be born, born with a scarlet letter and will never be touched ever again. Uh, so one of the challenges that I pose to the law firm partners here is when you hear these narratives, when you hear these rumblings at your law firms, are you questioning the narrative that is put out there about these associates of color under your employ? Uh, especially from my litigation partners, when do we ever accept one side of the facts? <laughs> ever, on anything. We always get the other side of the facts, right? So why would we make any exception when it comes to the efficiency of attorneys of color uh, in our law firms? And so these are the real life collective experiences of the diverse associates who work for your firms. And hopefully in hearing some of this tonight, that motivates you to think about these issues. Uh, because remember, we're going to impact diversity and inclusion in our profession. It takes a village. And so I will endeavor to be worthy of this award. And I hope that you will join me in that. With that, I'll turn over to Joe Silver.